how much work goes on here and how much help everybody needs to give everybody the same opportunities to, to work, to grow, to develop through physical activity and through sport. So my, uh, my journey started in Warwickshire in a small town called Rugby, uh, which is not too much unlike, uh, unlike Spalding, as it were. It's just a very, very small market town, uh, much like Loughborough, where, where I'm currently living is a small market town. Um, but we wouldn't be very much like the university, which provides a lot of the employment for the local, local economic social structure. That's Loughborough. Rugby is very much like the school. There's rugby school. That's where I went to school. That place also provides a lot of support to the local local market towns. So the more activity that we have in an area through these, local, through these localities, the more affluent the place becomes, the more funding you can provide, the more, uh, the more opportunities there are for not just young people, but anybody that wants to be physically active and, and, and enjoy themselves. So, <clears throat> which one are we clicking? Next. Oh, fantastic. Me with some young people. Yay. So, as an ambassador for Inspire Plus, some of you might have heard of Inspire Plus before, I think we've done some work with you in collaborations with people in the room. Uh, definitely run a lot of half camps out of St. Paul's, uh, just down the road. Uh, I have done lots of work in, in Ledney, in, in, in Gedney, in Lutton, in uh, Western Hills, where else have we been? Deep in St. James, in the deep things. We've been all over this area, and as far, and even as far north as uh, <laughs> as Grimsby. <laughs> See, this is um, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, our remit is to provide <clears throat> coaching, uh, well-being, mentoring, uh, half camps through holidays, Christmas and Easter, um, a CPD for teachers. Our remit is so huge. Essentially, we use. The people, the people premium, rain fence, sports premium funding the government provides to primary schools. They invest that money into our charity and we provide services to them that can help build the profile of P and sport um, in their school. So when Ofsted come knocking, <coughs> I hate them. When they come knocking, they're satisfied that everyone's doing a good job and the children are essentially happy, healthy and active. That's our, that, that, that's our remit. Um, and I came through to be this ambassador through my work, <laughs> my previous work, uh, as an athlete, a track and field athlete. So my very, very, very first Paralympic Games I competed in uh, was at London 2012. Uh, how many of you remember London 2012? Watch it on TV. What a fantastic time to be alive that was. Still a fantastic time to be alive, but wow, that was that, that was something else. Um, speaking of fantastic times, who knew that Wales would be the first team to qualify for the quarterfinals of the World Cup? <laughs> who knew that? Incredible! And my stepfather being an Aussie is crying. He's been crying all weekend. Oh, I've been crying since Sunday night. So I've never seen an Australian team this bad. But I've never seen a Wales team this good. It's amazing. Um, yeah, fantastic time. So my, my debut was uh, when I was being chased by guys dressed as bananas. <laughs> that was the 200 meters. And then four years later, I switched sports and started throwing. Started throwing the shot put. So uh, those are the two events I've been competing in. Uh, and I now do very different. I now do very different sport, which is cycling. Um, but every story has to start somewhere, so let's show you a really embarrassing photograph. Uh, this was in 1991, I believe, maybe just, just back end of 1990. Uh, there's Mumsy. So long story cut short, my disability, my impairment, is something called cerebral palsy. I was born with it uh, three months too early. Uh, Mum was diagnosed with a placenta previa. Uh, so they had to get me out super quick, otherwise it would have been the end of me and the end of her. So I was born in six months, premature, very, very, very early, head was the size of a tennis ball, weighed the same as a bag of sugar, uh, the future was very, very bleak, and I know for a fact that uh, consultants in child development and midwives are still telling mothers and parents of children with disabilities and impairments that it's a hopeless case and they're never going to make it and the future is so, so bleak still. And they were telling me, telling me and mum was that in 1990. Why are we still saying these things? They told her that she was so, so stubborn. But I was like, no, Sam will do whatever he wants to do. When the NHS team came with the walker, when I was, when I was like two or three, just threw it in the loft. So they don't think don't that. He'll do it on his own. Trust me when I tell you he'll do it on his own. I'm very, very, very lucky to have someone like that in my corner, uh, still in the corner. And uh, she was very, 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 very stubborn. And believed in very much the power of the mind. She's a bit witchy. In that sense, she very much believed in the power of the mind. Like the mind will provide where the body cannot, uh, and somewhat of the product you see here before you today. And then this pink tennis ball head came along here. This is little brother, and he's the most annoying thing I've ever come across. But I love him dearly. Uh, how many of you are fortunate enough to have a sibling? Fortunate enough. Very fortunate enough. Well, the hands are, change the word. The hands go up and they go down. Uh, who's the firstborn in the house? 
Yes, first horn. Woohoo! We're the most important, right? Because we're the blueprint. Yeah, they learn from us. So really, everything the parents know, they learn from us. So we're the most important. Who are the second horns? The ones that came second. Okay, okay, you're the ones that are like the perfect children because you looked at all the mistakes the first one made. Now you don't make those mistakes anymore. So now you're the perfect children. Uh, who came third, fourth, fifth, sixth? Very, very last ones. Ah, oh, the ones that smile and get away with everything that you did. It's like, I can do no wrong. Or maybe, maybe, maybe your parents just stopped caring about it. Whatever it was. Like, we've had this many, you just gotta get on with it. You'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Uh, but my brother and I, we're best friends. Now, have a look at this photo, and you tell me whether you think Sam, from primary school, was a troublemaker or a teacher's pet. Troublemakers, troublemaker, troublemaker, put your hands up, troublemaker. And teacher's pet. Troublemaker, people, you were right, absolutely right. Look at that face. That face is devilish. The demon. I can do no wrong. That was me at school. Now, I was, and I, I was probably one of the worst behaved, extremely happy, never nasty, never mean. I just never did as I was told. Never did my homework. Nobody could tell me nothing. But I was a happy child, uh, happy go lucky. And when I had my cerebral palsy, it was way more severe than it is now. All the training that I've done, all the work I've done on my legs, I used to walk with my knees together, on my tiptoes. Very typical gait from the cerebral palsy. Uh, had uh, physio development for the NHS, uh, had uh, steel cap shoes, uh, shin splints. So anyone's ever seen it six quarter procedure, they usually have shin splints. Absolutely bloody awful things. And now I see kids with them and they're like designed. The They've got the Avengers on them. Mine were like stock blue. I'm so dead. I'm like, your splints are so cool. But it is cool seeing a young one in sprints and them saying, and that me telling them, do you know what? I used to wear those. And I'm like, what? They're like, you know, you can stand so tall. How did you do that? Because I moved around. Because <laughs> I didn't listen to what the doctors said. They said that I would never walk, I never run, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't ride a bike. Wouldn't ride a bike. And I would ride a bike for a living. Which is mental, if you think about it. Um, and my brother and I were best of friends. And we still are best of friends. Uh, and I thought it'd be important to show you all, we're going to play a little game, show you all the importance of that everybody kind of starts on the same page. I'm not going to say that we will have the same 24 hours as Beyonce, because we don't. <laughs> That's a lie. But we all start off small, and we all have to go somewhere. So let's play a game. Uh, let's play spot the person in the picture. Uh, the girl in the pink dress, I don't wonder who that is. She had a famous face. She won a title once. She, she does do that. Yeah, she does that with the thing. With the thing. Yeah. yeah, that's Emma. That's Emma Redekhan, of course. One of them. USA Open Champion. Um, how kind of was it that Coco Goff at 19 won the US Open? That was, I loved watching that. What a spitting moment! 50 years of equal pay as well. We mean, in tennis, equal pay. I love it. Uh, let's move swiftly forward. Anyone know who this is? Uh, the cheeky chappy in the white, in the white t shirt. Any nerds in the room, uh, the movie and cinema heads probably know who that is. When I tell kids, especially boys in year 9, year 10, that this guy trained in ballet before he was Spider Man, I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm like, no way, Tom Holland's in ballet. Yes, bro. He's trained in ballet, so don't knock it. That seems good for you. You can save the world at the same time and do ballet. Uh, this one's easy. Isn't it? That's the ginger ninja himself. Yeah. That's the one and only. Um, <laughs> did, did, I remember, did he play a tape of his on, on the. Uh, what show was it? He was on Ross Holt. He was on. Uh, uh, not George Holt. What's his name? Jonathan Watts. That's him, yes. So he played the tape of him where he was singing absolutely terribly when he first started out. Absolutely awful. That guy would never get a record deal. And now he sells at Wembley whenever he wants. It's not Taylor Swift, but still, you know, he does his thing. Uh, this guy, anyone know who this is? <laughs> Poor guy, can't win a race anymore because he's in a slow car, but you know, <laughs> the procession that is Formula One. No one, no one cares about Red Bull anymore, I'm sick of it. Uh, but then again, years ago, I, I, I'm, I'm going to paint it both ways. Years ago, he was the one who won all the races, so you know, he wins some of these. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> this one's a bit closer to home. Maybe not actually, she's from Sheffield. But still, like, she crushed it in her time. Yeah, the, Olymp the former, well, she's not, once, once Olympic champion, always Olympic champion. So Jessica Ennis Hill, uh, Olympic champion in 2012, absolutely fantastic. So everybody has to start from somewhere, that's my point. Now, my inspirations uh, when I was growing up are from a, a bygone era, uh, before Wi-Fi, before Netflix. You had to wait for things to happen, you know, if one series finished, when we get to wait till it's on TV next week and you can talk about it, 
And uh, you pick up the phone to your mates at 6 p.m. because that's when calls were free. And if you're on the phone, someone to use the internet, you gotta hang that phone up because dial up connection only works one way. Uh, you know, tapes. I can show uh, some, some of the kids that I went to in year, in year 10, like floppy disk with a VHS cassette, and they wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's things on that you put in the computer? Yes. Look at this CD. This CD has 12 tracks. You're going to listen to it over and over and over again. How do you think we know the lyrics so well? Because we just play these over and over and over again. We'll never understand it. So my inspirations at school. The Power Rangers, obviously. Uh, Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny in a film called Space Jam. One of my favourite films of all time. I want to be a basketball player purely because of this film. Did we have a hoop anywhere near us? No. So Mum improvised. She got a little fruit on it from like Tesco, gave me some big balls and said, there you go, Michael. Go for your life. Go shoot some, go shoot some hoops. Because we never have a court anywhere near us. We couldn't afford a basketball either. So she improvised. Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, these guys are back on TV at the end of the year, I believe. Uh, my absolute heroes, to the extent I went to go and meet them at Comic Con in Stoke on Trent. That's how mad it was. And when you've got when you're being pumped by by Wolf and by Cobra and by Hunter, people say, oh, mate, you are a hench. Absolutely made my day. You know when your heroes say that you are hench. Um, such a good time to be alive. Um, and then this is this is the odd one out. Um, <laughs> and again, in this day and age, it's hard to explain to children that this is not a woman, it's a man. But you will know this. This is down hard. You will know this is Robert Williams. And I tell them that's also the same guy that played the genie. What do you get these kids in education? They're going to learn sometime, sometime soon. Um, this is the odd one out because when I was 11, my mum and my dad got divorced. And we had to move home. It was a very, very, very difficult time. Uh, we took, literally took everything in bags, I remember it so clearly, took everything in bags one night, up to the left, uh, went to the other side of the country, uh, and completely disappeared. And in that period where I was wondering, where is my dad? What's going on? I'm 11 years old, what if I got left with my family? This was the film that helped me make light of the choice, because of course it's a film about divorce. It's a comedy film about divorce. It's really, really funny, and it really, really helped me understand a lot more about the situation that I was in. So that's why I highlight this stuff. Again, the odd one out. Everyone knows this person is married, but of course, I know him and love him as the great one, people's champion. And if I didn't have cerebral palsy, I would have been a professional wrestler. I can guarantee it right now. This would have been my calling. This is where I was going to be. So, just because I wasn't as physically able as all of my peers, didn't mean I didn't gravitate towards things like I naturally saw things on TV and in the film that I couldn't be, that I wanted to be like. Uh, and as a result of that, it all came to a head when I finally started getting into school. School was that place where I could truly express myself in a physical context because there was no real other way. I didn't go to any clubs after school. I didn't really do anything physically. I went to the park, I played with friends, but it weren't for school or getting involved in PE. Even though it wasn't serious, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Um, and that's me in year nine. Typical average kid, you know, on free school meals single parent household, like the stats and the story would say, I shouldn't be here talking to you coming from brick recycling. The stats don't say that. But I had someone in my corner, head of Key Stage 3, Miss Lahoy, wonderful guy from Leeds, who pulled me up by my, by, my, by my collar and said, Sam, you stop being an idiot, stop being one of the cool kids, you know, one of the man then, I know you love, I know you love doing that, um, you can fix up, look sharp, do what your mum says, and actually pay attention to your studies because you can be really, really, really good. So draw maybe year nine, nice guy in year 11, got some friends that don't bully me, don't pick on me, people that actually rape me, so I was bullied a lot at school because of the way that I walked the way that I ran, and I had some badges too, so I became head boy. And everything flipped full circle. When I went to this place, this is rugby school, and I went here on a scholarship. This is like the Eton, the Harrow, like the big boys of independent public schools. Um, <laughs> and I can only go here on a scholarship, because this place is like 20,000 pounds a year to go to. Uh, so they paid for everything, my books, my lessons. Uh, my science teacher, who was, also, who was also the basketball head coach, actually paid my kit for me because I couldn't afford that either. So I literally have my product of scholarships, grants, and other people's favours. Um, and a lot of that is come to, comes down to me working hard for it, yes, but the opportunity and the funding and the uh, the uh, had to be there in the shop window for me to be able to access it. it had to be there first, which is the most important thing. Um, went to Loughborough University after A levels because I was a nerd, and it was there I started playing American football. 
and still was trying to be part of that Jackson 5 tribute band. <laughs> maybe Earth, Wind and Fire, maybe, that, maybe that's a better one. Because it is September. Do you remember? Hey, you play that song anywhere that it goes off. What an incredible tune. Um, and, uh, and again, you're probably wondering, how do you fit a helmet under that? It's like, you can. Trust me, everyone loved to remember it. Just take helmet off. Okay, it's a half so it was such a good time to be alive. Um, but I think the most important thing about that journey through player contact sport at university, what would have made things really inaccessible for me, was not necessarily because, although I have cerebral palsy, I'm still, I'm still seen and perceived to be quite able, because I don't use a mobility aid. So nobody looks at me and thinks, oh, you know, he might struggle. But when it comes to me running in a straight line, I'm like Bambi on ice. So you can imagine a contact sport where you can pretty much always be hit. It's not like rugby, like you have to be, have your head more simple. Like meerkat movies, literally. Um, the, the thing that made this really, really inaccessible was a bad attitude from my coaches. And that pretty much, 100% of the time, it's not facilities, it's not funding, it's not opportunities, it's other people and their perceptions and their attitudes towards someone else and then making their own assumptions based on what I think you can get out of it. So I don't think it's for you, don't bother taking part. If my coaches had had that attitude, this would never have happened. They want me with open arms and said, Sam, the fact that you want to play football means we're going to embrace you. And I was one of the only people in the British University League at the time to have a disability and play this game. And if it wasn't for their attitudes, those are my coaches, again, the story would never have happened. So I think that's probably the, the main thing I would take out. All of this in terms of inclusion. The one thing that I think is most important is having an open mind and asking questions. And a big part of promoting inclusion is promoting understanding and knowledge and a wealth of means that you can apply that knowledge and help other people feel welcome and feel included. Um, and that comes from networking, which is a big part of why you're here today. So, big up yourselves. Uh, London 2012, long, long story cut short. So I went from football to athletics are being talent spotted by this man here, that's Joe in the black, in the black top, he's Coach Joe. Uh, he, he found me in December 2011, said you look like you can run fast in a straight line with cerebral palsy. Oh, acknowledge, he was the first one ever that spotted my disability and said, you can actually run with that in like Paris sport. You do know that, don't you? First person to ever see it. And the first person to ever say, Sam, you have talent for this. You have a talent for running straight line. Really? Me talented for sport? No, no, I'm a nerd. Too much time for my books. But he saw it, August 2012, long story cut short. I'm going to call him Mumsy on the phone in Tesco, find some friend. <laughs> when I got the call from the selectors saying, Sam, we were actually for the Great Britain squad. First ever vest for GB at London 2012, biggest event on the planet. And I was going, she broke down in tears. Because all she could see and hear down that phone was a tennis ball headed bag of sugar. But now, we are in this country, in front of 80,000 people. Everyone's crying. And what a time to be alive. It's literally pushed so we wouldn't be having conversations around para sport and inclusive sport, inclusive activity now, if it wasn't for these friends of mine being blasted all over the TV, all over the newspapers, all over the internet. Yes, I'm not stupid. It didn't check, it didn't suddenly wave magic one and everything was better. But it certainly helped challenge perception. It certainly helped challenge attitudes towards what people with disability can achieve as opposed to what they can't achieve. That's the most important thing. And ultimately, people saw it as an opportunity to see people not as disabled, but just differently abled. They just do things differently to the norm. And that was probably the best thing about the Paralympic Games. Now, I switched sports because track, <laughs> I wasn't as fast as I thought, so I switched sports. I went to throwing things, throwing cannibals into sand. That required a massive change of training, lots more weights, Getting bigger, getting hench, which I enjoyed the most. Uh, but then I started getting really worried, really, 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 really worried, really scared. So I like to use Pikachu as a result of this. I got really, really, really scared because it was a brand new event, a brand new thing. And if anyone remembers the last time they felt nervous, scared, or anxious, it's usually because of something that you didn't understand, you don't know. And we've all been there as practitioners. We've all come across someone, a situation, or something, or an individual, and you've gone, Oh, uh, I don't know how I can help you. And you tried to figure out how to do it, and you said, oh, I don't really know what to do. Ah, okay, I'll ask someone else. Well, you really, really want to help them. 
The best thing you could do, like how I felt when I got to Rio and I realised that this is way over my head, I don't have enough time to prepare for this, and it sucked. I failed because I let the nerves and the fear and the anxiety get into my head. And I wish I'd learned what I'd learned as a result of that. Unfortunately, it's typically the way, something bad has to happen to you first to learn how to deal with it, so when it does happen again, it doesn't affect you as much later. That's how pain works, that's how experience works. A bad thing has to happen. So sometimes you just gotta learn to trust yourself. That fight or fight thing is a real thing. It lives inside you, it lives in all of us. Uh, <laughs> you can fly or you can fight, you know, like Peter Ben. Uh, and it's part of our natural defense mechanism. It's there for a reason. It's completely natural, but what you have control over is the response. This is what we have control over now. We don't have to worry about how that thing made us feel. Oh, we're anxious, we're scared, we're nervous. Um, and then the emotions take over. But we can actually control, we can't control the situation and how it made us feel, but we can control how we respond to it. And I learned that through the bad experience in Rio that absolutely sucked. Everyone needs a whack. Everyone needs their wellness action plan. Uh, and I think part of the plan is very simple. Uh, being hydrated, eating well, and sleeping well. The simple things done well. The building blocks to, to, to help. Before we even talk about being physically active, come on, click it, work with me here. Before even being physically active, these are the things that everybody can do to a certain extent to help them take care of themselves and work through those, through those emotions. And one of my favorite rappers, poets, this is the only, this gentleman is the only man to win the Pulitzer Prize, for, uh, an art prize for one of his musical albums. And he famously said, uh, I've got some regrets, but my past will keep my best. So I had to learn through quite a few considerable failures in my career that there's something to be learned from, and you only, you only make a mistake if you fail to learn from it. Um, and, and I like to use music as, as part of that. Uh, and cycling was another talent ID program. Thank you, UK Sports. Thank you, Sport England. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not silly that I fully believe that the reason why we are on non lottery funding, publicly funded money, is because we're a big part of that inspiration piece. From the, yes, it's from the top down, but we're a big part of the inspiration piece. And I tell you, I, I, and I firmly believe this, after the World Championships, where I won this, won the Highland Coup, won the Highland Coup, after the World Championships, I had messages from parents, from children with cerebral palsy, that said, my son wants to ride a bike, because he saw me on TV, he saw the way he walked, and he was like, I, I, I know, I, I, he, do, he does what I do, he waddles around, and they want, they want to get on bikes, like, and that was amazing, because the World Championships, for the first time ever, were, this is amazing, the first time ever, they were combined together, the Olympic and Paralympic teams were on the same track, same time in front of the same crowd. The, the, the best sample I think we've had after the Paralympic Games was the Rugby League World Cup in 2022. We have the men's tournament, the women's tournament, and the wheelchair tournament going on simultaneously at the same time. And at Old Trafford, even though Kevin Sinto got the biggest cheer of the day, that was Sir Kev. Um, <laughs> the, the biggest cheer, aside from Sir Kev, was when the men's team, the women's team, and the wheelchair team all were given their trophies in front of the entire crowd at the end of the tournament. It was fantastic. Showed it could be done. So we were integrated for the very, very, very first time. And this is a actual proof that it happened. Very much in Greece. Second one gets on the line for Great Britain. Actually, wait, let's break that. So just for con just for context, just for the context, I am the second to last rider to go up in the kilo final. Okay, I know I have a time to beat. I'm fully prepared in my head, even though Sandra would be better. Why would you not go into a race wanting to win? I I'm fully aware of where I stand. The Chinese in this race on paper were faster than me, and I knew that, so I was fully prepared to go into the final going, I'm just going to repeat my performance, and what will be will be. I probably won't win, won't win the gold, but I'm not going to be, I'm going to be here once, I'm going to make the most of it, and do as fast as I can. So I'm the second class rider to go, and all I can do is go as fast as possible. Right, let's see if that will play again. Come on. Oh, he's ruined it! He's absolutely ruined it! No! Oh, technology is a pain in me. Right, let's try this time. Come on, boys and girls. Click. Oh, I think it's, it's broken. No, it's not broken. Yes. What's the time? What's the time? It's 
Sam Wright gets underway for Great Britain. As well. <laughs> the key to a few of ranks anyone that watches and has seen the track race is get by the speed as quickly as possible. Uh, and the time trial, the time stats always go red or green. Red is bad, red means you're too slow to get quicker. <laughs> and for the majority of these splits, I'm down on the clock. So I'm 1.2 seconds behind the leading rider. But the bike is getting faster. But I'm still not gaining. So I'm 1.4 seconds now. Everybody's watching. Still 1.4 seconds to gain in a lap in 250 meters. Now, this is a little bit more. Still 1.1. Half a lap to go. The lap table is building. And it's 0.4 to go. And it's just going to be the last lap. Just about Averaging nearly 50 kilometers per hour. So, so, so fast. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was absolutely mental. I, can't, I cannot express the feeling of coming round the corner and having a crowd just push you, just push you over the line because you know, you're getting so, 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 so close. Um, I think this is probably the best bit though. This is, this is me in the hot seat, so I know I'm the leading rider. And the last rider is currently about to finish his last lap. Dave was part of Chris Hoy's crop um, and then became a coach. So if you're in a same training group as Chris Hoy, you can imagine what that's like, watching someone that literally won everything. Uh, he, he also did the kilo and uh, he, he messaged me after that and said, mate, I've not, I've not been that happy in such a long time. The way you did that race, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but all of it has happened. There was a lot of emotion in that celebration as well because uh, the day I won that, the day I set, the day I set on the podium, um, was actually the day of my biological father's funeral. Um, and it was a very, very, very bittersweet day. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to feel, it's, it's hard to feel for, for a stranger, someone that you hadn't spoken to for nearly 16 years. Uh, and you do wonder um, what could have been. But despite everything that's happened in the past, as I said, uh, you can't let your past keep you from your best because the potential is always, always there. And I, there are, in terms of, I know we're here to service the whole county and not just people, but when it comes to young people, all they need is someone like, someone like my key stage spring manager. You know, someone that sees something in them that they don't see in themselves and just says, no, you can do this, pick yourself up, we're gonna help you, we're gonna do it, we're gonna move it, we're gonna move the people together and, uh, and you need to keep the faith. And I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, so, uh, thanks everyone for listening. I appreciate your time. I really hope that you find this day worthwhile. Uh, and I also hope that, you know, <laughs> no questions too big, no questions too small. There are no stupid questions, just stupid people. I'm joking. <laughs> um, thank you again, guys. Have a wonderful day. And, uh,